Hi and welcome back everybody to another reaction video where we try to learn something new and to spread history on YouTube. Okay, so today we're going to continue with the second part from Oversimplified about uh, Hitler. Uh, the first part ended with Hitler uh, with, with the end of the First World War. So we now enter the period, the inner war period between the First and the Second World War. As always, all the links how you can support the channel are in the description below. So check it out and um, if you like this concept just hit the subscribe button and don't forget the ring bell to get notified when new videos come out. Um, and I will give of course some additional information that I know to the video and I would like to have your take in the comment section below and um, also suggestions for the next video. So let's just jump in. Since Germany's military had to be reduced, Hitler could no longer remain a soldier after the war, but he kept working for the army as an informant. After the war, communists in Germany had attempted a revolution, and the government was worried about communism in general. So Hitler was tasked with infiltrating and reporting on any new political parties that could pose a communist threat. A new party called the German Workers' Party threw up a whole bunch of red flags, so Hitler went along to one of their meetings, but found that they weren't communist at all. They were extreme right and shared many of his extreme beliefs, so he left the army and signed up to yep. join the party. His fantastic speaking abilities impressed the party's leadership and supporters, and he very quickly rose to the top. He decided the party needed a makeover, so he renamed it to the National Socialist German Workers' Party, or Nazi for short, and he gave it a new color scheme. The Nazis weren't very specific on policy, but Hitler made extravagant promises to return Germany to its former glory by undoing the Treaty of Versailles and reuniting all ethnic Germans into one nation. He also said that only pure... Yeah, as we said in the last video, uh, the pan-Germanic idea was very widespread. And as you can see, like in this part of Poland, in the western parts of Poland today, if you call it that way, uh, during uh, in, in the inner war period, there were a lot of Germans living in that territory. And we also know the Sudetenland, Sudetendeutsche in the Czech Republic. There were also a lot of Germans there. And of course, uh, the Austrian part. But yeah, he his idea was to unite all the Germans in one country. Aryan people should be allowed to be citizens and that all Jews would lose their citizenship. These ideas were already common in extreme right politics, but what set the Nazis apart was Hitler himself, and they quickly became the leading party on the extreme right. Many of the political parties in Germany at the time had paramilitary wings, and the Nazis were no different. Hitler set up the very descriptive whole protection detachment, later changed to the very delightful gymnastic and sports division, <laughs> and finally settling on the ominous storm detachment, or SA for short. Their job was to defend Nazi party meetings yep. and intimidate political opponents and they would frequently engage in battles with communists on the streets. Since the Allies had demanded a reduction in Germany's military... Uh, just one quick note. Uh, I know that in the US, like, the Second Amendment is a big topic, and I don't want to politicize it, but I just want to give uh, additional information for that time uh, in Germany. Actually, the German <clears throat> law regarding firearms was very loosened, so you could get a firearm or a pistol in that period very easily. So all the, as you saw, like it wasn't just a thing for the Nazi party to have like those paramilitary, whatever, uh, party troops, but it was common back then. And of course, because uh, all the gun laws were, weren't strict back then, they were also... Uh, they would also uh, have firearms, not only like something to hit with, but also something to shoot with. Uh, so yeah, that the, the Weimar Republic and the inner war period in Germany was filled with, with violence and all the horrific things that you can imagine, like civilians fighting civilians on street and so on. Size, many trained soldiers were left unemployed. They liked the Nazi ideology, and it was only natural for them to join the SA, which grew larger and larger over time. 
Yep. The new democratic government that formed after World War I was pretty weak and ineffective. In order to pay reparations to the Allies, it started printing more money. The problem is that printing money doesn't actually give a country more money, it just makes money less valuable. So as the country Inflation. printed more and more money, it became worth less and less, and the currency crashed. In 1919, one US dollar was worth about four German marks. By December 1923, one US dollar was equal to 4.2 trillion marks. The price of bread rose to 200 billion marks. Banknotes became worthless. Unsurprisingly... Yeah, we all know the, the famous pictures from Germany back then where people would um, buy bread with a whole bag with cash. So it was pretty crazy. And if you uh, look into like the psychological aspect, like it was in one generation. So it wasn't like, okay, 100 years later, but it was like, what, five, six years later, all, all the inflation and all the bad economic stuff happened. So it, it was really crazy. In such an economic crisis, Germany struggled to pay the Allies. The French were pissed about this, so they occupied the Ruhr, an area full of factories, and took the economic output from the area as payment. They treated the German civilians badly, and in total, approximately 130 Germans were killed during the occupation. Yep. Germans were furious, and Hitler and the Nazis thought... Yeah, the French were very strict about, about the reparations, and uh, the occupa occupation of Ruhr was... Um, how to put it mildly let's say brutal so the first step was they would uh, take all the things that were produced by the Ruhr and the Ruhr region uh, in today's um, federate state Nordrhein-Westfalen uh, was one of the like more industrious and more um, rich regions of Germany so if you take that away from Germany like Germany's econ economy would just crash and the French would first take all the products that were made in Ruhr and after that, when they wanted to uh, get the reparations even faster and faster, they started to dismantle the industry there, like to take all the machines and everything and transfer it back to, to, to France and to produce all the products in France. So it was really a, let's say it, a harsh time for Germany. And especially also like the symbolic gesture like, hey, enemy troops can just walk into Germany and take whatever they want. And of course, that had a negative effect on the population. Understandable. Just try to put yourself in that time frame or in, in that time were killed during the occupation, Germans were furious, and Hitler and the Nazis thought that now would be a great time to lead a revolution. In November 1923, inspired by something a certain bold Italian man did a year earlier, yep. Hitler stormed a meeting at a beer hall and called for an uprising against the government. With his supporters, he marched on the streets of Munich, hoping the police would join his side. They did not. Hitler was put on... Yeah, that was the, the famous uh, beer hall putsch in 1923. Uh, uh, and also known as the Munich Munich Putsch. But uh, yeah, his popularity wasn't big back then. Uh, so he was uh, considered like an outsider, not a great political figure and so on. So the politicians and the people who were in charge back then and also like uh, police officers and so on, they wouldn't hesitate to fire on them because... The Weimar Republic was, as I said, like a history or a time period in German history where brutal conflicts, street fights and so on were very, very common. So for the police to shoot on some protesters, it was like, yeah, OK trial for treason. He could have been sentenced to life, but the right-wing judges thought he was a pretty cool guy. Hitler knew the judges and knew that they would be lenient, so he took the opportunity to make impassioned speeches during the trial. And in the end, he was sentenced to just five years in prison, of which he only served nine months. And when I say prison, it was more like a pleasant hotel stay where he had plenty of time to write a book. Yeah. The whole affair was covered by the media nationwide, and it made Hitler famous. Hitler and his extreme message were now known throughout Germany, but the everyday Germans still didn't care much for him. Yeah, like we all know that like negative press is also press. So the word is also going to be spread. But In the 1928 election, the Nazis only won about 2%. Yeah, that's actually interesting. In 19, like uh, the, the, the Munich Putsch was in 1923. 
So his popularity was even less than 2.6% because it, it was a new party and people saw it like a really extreme party and so on. So by 1928, he had only 2.6%. And if we look at other parties, like one of the, or the biggest party back then was the SPD, so the Social Democratic Party of Germany, Sozialdemokratische Partei Deutschland, the Social Democratic Party of Germany. And if you take like social democracy in Europe and also, not to get political today, but it's very hard to not get political with, with such topics. But social democratic parties in Europe are, or the ideas are more like center. So between like communism and capital, it's like in the center. And if you uh, see like the social democratic party in Germany back then, they had 30%, so the majority. And they, 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 most of the people in Germany were like moderates, let's change, let's, let's twerk a little bit the system and work inside the system and so on. Uh, and for comparison, let's say uh, KPD or Kommunistische Partei Deutschland, so the communists in German, Germany had only or had 10, between 10 and, and 11 percent. So they weren't also, they weren't also that popular. So most of the Germans were actually moderates in, the, in that question. But yeah. In the 1928 election, the Nazis only won about 2% of the vote. Many were still intimidated by all the violence and the shouting and how unpolitician like he was. But a new economic crisis would change all of that. To help Germany pay its reparations, America agreed to give it loans. In October 1929, the Wall Street crash happened, and America yeah. wanted its money back. The economic strain this put on an already struggling Germany was severe. Unemployment skyrocketed, poverty was widespread, and Germans were sick of it. It was clear that the newly formed democracy wasn't working. In the face of crisis, Germans began moving to the political extremes. If you were German and wanted change, your choices yeah. now were either the communists or the Nazis. Yeah. Hitler claimed that he was the only one who could return Germany to its former glory. The Nazi party used propaganda to make Hitler seem like a great and powerful man, and they gave the German people a scapegoat to blame for all their suffering. The promise of a single strong dictator was a breath of fresh air for Germans after years of failing democracy. Some bought into his extreme ideology. Some didn't agree with the racism, but were willing to vote for him anyway. Many didn't know much about politics at all, but just got caught up in the yeah, hype. Election watched. after election, the Nazis became more and more popular, until in 1932, yeah, just look at this. Like, uh, we said that in 1928 he had like, what, 2.6%? Look at this. The Wall Street crash, and then he was the second largest party in Germany. And then two years two years later, he was the, the biggest party. Like, the Nazi party was the biggest party in Germany. And, yeah, the people, all the moderates who are like in here like in the SPD realm you can see how the support for the moderates fell and uh, yeah people just want didn't believe in a moderate way to uh, to solve all the economic problems that they had so they looked for other things and other ways to solve it and yeah that's how we came to power the Nazis became more and more popular until in 1932 they became the biggest party in the German parliament. Yep. Hitler came to truly believe that he was some sort of great destined savior of Germany. He turned megalomaniac. He decided to run for president and did surprisingly well, but still lost but to lost. the extremely popular World War I general, Paul von Hindenburg. Since he was now the leader of the biggest party though, he demanded President Hindenburg make him chancellor. But Hindenburg was reluctant, seeing that Hitler was clearly such a big racist. Industry leaders urged Hindenburg to give Hitler the chancellorship, fearing the rising support for communism. And leader of the center party von Papen, who had been secretly negotiating with Hitler, said to Hindenburg, how about we make Hitler chancellor on the condition that I get to be vice chancellor and most mm -hmm. government jobs go to yep. us moderate conservatives. That way, I'll get to keep my power. I mean, we'll get to keep our power and we'll control Hitler like he's our angry little puppet. What could possibly go wrong? As it turned out, Everything. Everything. Hitler. Yeah, yeah. Von Papen will never be repatriated. Uh, like in history, uh, his main idea was to make Hitler chancellor, so they would form some kind of a co coalition between uh, uh, their parties. He would make uh, Hitler the chancellor, 
and then he would try to sabotage Hitler from the inside, from the parliament. And then when the situation gets even worse and worse, he could point the finger at him and his party. Like, look at how, how bad they done. Uh, they didn't make good decisions and so on. So that was actually the strategy from von Papen. But as we all know, like uh, Hitler tricked him and took over the power. Hitler became chancellor of Germany in January 1933, but he was not yet a dictator. In February, the German parliament building was set on fire. Reichstag Historians Brand. still aren't sure who did it, and many suspect the Nazis Reichstag did it Brand. themselves. But Hitler blamed the communists, and he convinced President Hindenburg to sign an emergency decree allowing him to imprison all communists and other political opponents. Communists and others were sent off to the first concentration camp in Dachau. At this time, the elder... Just a quick note, Dachau, uh, the concentration camp Dachau, uh, is near Munich, so in ba Bavaria. Communists and others were sent off to the first concentration camp in Dachau. At this time, the elderly president Hindenburg passed away, giving Hitler the perfect opportunity. He introduced a law to parliament that would allow him to make all future laws and decisions entirely on his own. With his political opponents imprisoned and the SA intimidating others, Hitler's law passed. Just two months after becoming chancellor, Hitler was now a dictator. He still had one problem. The leader of the SA wanted the SA to take over the job of the regular German army, and the German army didn't like that idea. Hitler needed to maintain the support of his professionally trained German army, more so than his rough and rowdy SA. So one night in June 1934, he had Rom and many other of his own SA officers rounded up and murdered. While he was at it, he took the opportunity to brutally settle some personal scores as well. Politicians who had disagreed with him in the past, reporters who had printed negative articles about him, one guy who did absolutely nothing, but they thought he was someone else. In some cases, even their families were murdered. In total, up to 200 people were killed in what became known as the Night of the Long Knives. The army, now satisfied that they wouldn't be replaced, pledged total allegiance to their new Führer, and Hitler's control was now absolute. Life in Germany changed violently. Freedom of the press, expression, and public assembly were suspended. Jews were initially branded and their businesses boycotted. And eventually, Hitler would go on to have six million Jewish men, women, and children killed in concentration camps. Hundreds of thousands of people were forced into sterilization for physical and mental imperfections. The Hitler youth became a way to brainwash the young. Boys were trained to fight and returned home from camp violent. Girls were told their purpose was to have many pure Aryan children, and they would sometimes return from camp pregnant. When their parents were understandably horrified, their children would threaten to turn them over to the Gestapo for standing in the way of Germany's greatness. The standard greeting changed, and you could be sent to a concentration camp for not using it. This way, it seemed like everyone was a Nazi supporter. If you dared oppose Hitler... Uh, just some quick notes uh, on the topics he discussed. Um... Yeah, like, because of the Nazi ideology, everything that went bad inside of the country was blamed either on the Jews or the communists, and uh, they would, they've been put into the same uh, basket, or the same basket, like, they were, it, it was told, like, he, they told that everything that went wrong was because of them. Uh, regarding the victims of the camps, uh, people... Yeah, um, the, the, the Jews were, of course, the, the ones who were targeted the most and had the most victims. But they also targeted homosexuals. Uh, they targeted uh, gypsies. They targeted uh, also political enemies like we saw in Dachau. Like the first concentration camp was actually for political prisoners. Uh, and uh, they had actually a lot of people that were non-Jewish, but were their enemies also sent to the concentration camps. And what else? Yeah, the Hitler Jugend, Hitler Jugend, uh, as we saw like with the, with the camps and so on, it is said that the German army was actually uh, efficient like in the Western Front with France, because as we saw like in the first video, Hitler was uh, very, uh, fascinated and uh, and everything with the military because of his military service in the first world war so the whole so german society was formed like a military society w where everything was focused to improve the military and so on and it began uh, with with within a young age with the hitler youth 
where you would join there and then you would train the whole summer to use rifles, to jump, to whatever. And uh, historians argue that because of that implementation, the German army was actually very efficient on the Western Front. But, like that was one of the main reasons. Uh, and the second thing, yeah, with the with the females, like with the girls, yeah, they they were mostly seen as how to put it mildly, uh, mildly, uh, to just to advance the the German the the so called Aryan race. So their purpose was just to make as much children as possible. Why? Because the Germans could use those kids or those people for like new recruits for new soldiers for upcoming wars so it was it was very crazy and of course uh, the germ the, the the nazi propaganda made it all seem like hey everybody is in this together everybody approves of him and so on of course there were dissident voices but they were silent very uh, si silenced very quickly so everything seemed like hey, if you don't join the movement, you're not cool, you're not, you know what I mean, you, you're not, you're an outsider. So a lot of people who weren't buying the original, like, propaganda and so on, uh, fell for it. This way, it seemed like everyone was a Nazi supporter. Yeah. If you dared oppose Hitler or speak out against him in any way, you also would be sent to a concentration camp. German nationalism captivated the young Adolf. Extreme ideology and anti-Semitism festered in him as a young man living a hard life on the streets. Germany's defeat in the First World War filled him with hatred and a thirst for vengeance. A political movement that treated him like a god and hundreds of thousands looking up to him as their savior made him a yeah. megalomaniac. And soon, his aggressive foreign policies would drag the world into a second tragic global conflict, otherwise known as Yeah, they make they make so good such good videos or simplify. Yeah, uh, the thing is uh, with with Germany back then. I also wanted to point out with the at the beginning I forgot to to say it, but with the violent uh, um, society in Weimar, uh, there there was also a um, so called Spartacus uprising or the uh, November uprising or. There are many ways to, or, or many terms to, 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 to call it, in ba Bavaria, where uh, the German Communist Party uh, and social, like German communists and socialists and the Spartacus movement, uh, tried to make a communist revolution in Germany, and they were violently put down by German soldiers and German police, and everything. And one of the leaders of the revolution. A very known uh, woman called Rosa uh, Rosa Luxemburg Bo Rosa Luxemburg was also killed, uh, and it was by the order of the German uh, Social Democratic Party. So the divide between, like the let's call them the the German left, like the Social Democrats and the Communists and the Socialists, was even bigger. Like the Weimar Republic was, as I said brutal and 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 uh the economic situation was bad and as the economic situation went bad uh like worse and worse uh you uh, as you saw on the chart the popularity of the nazi party and hitler grew and grew with time so yeah i hope that you enjoyed it um hit the subscribe button and the ring bell if you want to get notified for future videos and um, yeah there's also a patreon page and everything you need to know is down in the description below so thank you once again and see ya